welcome to an exciting new chess series. Over the course of our 12 programmes, I will be joined by world-famous newspaper editor, chess enthusiast Donald Woods, to present my choice from the millions of tournament games documented over the centuries of the 12 best games ever played. They are games which will take us round the world and through history. They are games which witness brilliant masterstrokes of chessboard genius. Games which often heralded the fate of the World Championship itself. I hope they convey to you, the viewers, as powerfully as they have done to us, the sense of intellectual mystery and mental force which we associate with chess at its finest. We'll be analysing each game in detail, but we'll also be looking at the stories away from the board and at the extraordinary personalities who have helped develop the art and science of chess. We will start with the first ever international tournament held in London in 1851, when competitive chess was in its infancy. And on to the National Chess Congress held in New York in 1857, the very first official chess event held in the New World. Back to the London of the 1880s, half a century into Queen Victoria's reign, when the capital of the British Empire was at the height of its imperial glory. We see in 1892 the World Championship decided between two European Grandmasters in the tropical heat of Havana. In pre-revolutionary St. Petersburg, we witnessed the confirmation of a new champion, Emmanuel Lasker, the man who was to reign a record-breaking 27 years. While in Moscow, on the eve of a conflagration which was to engulf the civilized world, we witnessed the Cuban genius Capablanca hurl a thunderbolt so devastating that chess fans today still find its depths astounding. A new generation will be depicted after the carnage of the First World War. Displaced Russian emigres, such as Nimzovich, Alekin, and Bogolyubov, players impregnated with the twisted logic of four years of mass murder on European battlefields. Finally, we pass across the decades of Soviet domination, represented by Mikhail Botvinnik and Boris Spassky. This was broken solely and briefly by the temperamental American genius, Bobby Fischer, in 1972. We conclude with a taste of the marathon struggle between Anatoly Karpov and Garry Kasparov, a struggle for world supremacy that has lasted for half a decade. Perhaps the most dramatic game in this series is the one that catapulted Kasparov to becoming, at the age of 22, the youngest world champion in the history of chess. Our first game takes us to the very first international chess tournament in London in 1851. The London 1851 chess tournament was organized by the foremost player of the age, Howard Staunton. Also, coincidentally, the chess correspondent of the Illustrated London News. His match victory over the Frenchman saint Amand in 1843 had given him the equivalent of world champion status, although formal recognition of such a title will still some way in the future. Staunton was one of the very first to recognize the value of commercial endorsement, and he lent his name to the chess pieces designed by Nathaniel Cook, a leading craftsman of the period. Cook's pattern for the chess knight took the magnificent sculptures of horses' heads from the Elgin marbles, which Britain had recently acquired, as his inspiration. The Staunton patent chess sets are both elegant and functional, and for decades they have been the only ones in use in serious international competitions. At the time of this tournament, and for the next 30 years or so before the Staunton patent chess sets had become widely adopted, the more ornate barleycorn pattern of chess set was in general use. It is interesting that the pieces then tended to be red and white, not black and white. Some people still feel that these old-style bone pieces are far more beautiful than the Staunton design, but they are sadly, certainly, a lot less functional. 
they aren't the only element which has changed considerably today. Modern day grandmasters expect to play under controlled conditions in even light. Most games then will have been played by candlelight in an atmosphere something like this. The 1851 tournament crowned Staunton's achievements as a promoter of chess as he turned his energy and enthusiasm to creating an event which would attract all of Europe's leading players. Sixteen competitors took part in a series of grand individual matches as Staunton grandiosely described his knockout system. Staunton himself took fourth place, an unexpectedly poor showing, but perhaps one that was to be expected given the great effort that he had expended on organisation and in raising a prize fund of £500, an enormous sum for that time. The tournament heralded a new era for international competitive chess. It was the precursor of modern Grandmaster tournaments and of the modern World Championship cycle itself. The game we have chosen was played on the occasion of the 1851 tournament as a friendly game at Simpson's, the cigar and coffee divan so beloved by the chess fraternity of the day. Today, Simpson's operates as a restaurant and is still a favourite haunt of chess devotees. It was won by Adolf Anderson of Germany, a mathematician who remained amongst the world's top half dozen players until his death in 1879. Anderson was a quiet, gentlemanly academic from Breslau, where he lived with his mother and sister, never marrying. He later lost matches to Morphy and Steinitz, but dominated tournaments with victories at London in 1862 and Baden-Baden -Baden in 1870. Anderson's opponent was the Frenchman Lionel Kieseritzky. He was the inventor of a three-dimensional form of chess, which he utterly failed to make anyone else understand. Kieseritzky had a reputation as a difficult and irritable personality. When he died penniless, he received a pauper's burial, and no one attended the graveside. Kieseritzky was so dazzled by the brilliance of this game that he immediately telegraphed the moves to an awaiting audience at the Café de la Régence in Paris. He was known there, having installed himself as a chess tutor, giving lessons at five francs an hour. From that day on, this sparkling exploit has earned the sobriquet the immortal game. If there is one game that has been an inspiration to future generations of players, this is it. Anderson's part in it was later recalled during the 1920s when his imposingly intellectual features decorated German 75 penny currency coupons, where the moves and the diagram from the immortal game itself also appeared. Donald Woods, welcome. I'll be asking you to help me run through the moves of the immortal game in just a moment. First, I'd just like to ask you to tell us about your interest in chess. When did it first develop? Oh, a long time ago, Ray. But I wonder if you remember where we first met. Um, no, I don't, actually. 1976, in the South African Open. And uh, you were up on the enclosure with the grandmasters and superstars, sort of behind velvet ropes. Mm -hmm. And I was down in the middle of the body of the hall. And to my astonishment, you walked all the way down, stood at my board, and I thought, I must have a fantastic thing going here. Grandmaster Keen is interested. Mm -hmm. And you did this a couple of times. And afterwards, I came up to you, diffidently, to get an autograph. And... Um, you said, oh, um, I came down to your board because uh, I read an article you wrote in the Cape Times, and I was so disappointed that your interest had, had nothing to do with chess, and that's how I started our first met you. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been a, you know, I'm an average club hacker. I play for Surbiton when I can because I travel a lot. And so what I'll try and do is, is ask the sort of questions which a, an average club player would ask. That's wonderful. Yes. And how is your own chess now? Are you still playing? Well, when I get a chance to play, uh, you know, I'm very keen, but because I travel so much, I don't play as often as I'd like. Mm -hmm. So I've got to live these things through people like you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, that set the scene for our look at this brilliant game from 140 years. Adolf Anderson plays white, Lionel Kieseritzky plays black, and Anderson started off pawn to e4. Kieseritzky, as was common then, occupied the center, 
and Anderson played the King's Gambit. Ray, isn't that a bit dicey vacating F2 that early? I mean, to the average player, and to the extent that you can say as a general rule in chess. Yes, it also loses a pawn, because black can take it. But this is, the, the, the King's Gambit was really the main line opening then. When, when the modern powers of the pieces were developed in the Renaissance, when chess acquired its modern dynamic stance, um, the King's Gambit was one of the first openings that was analysed by the Italian theoreticians, and it stayed popular right up until the middle of the 19th century. And even nowadays, people like Spassky, uh, and occasionally Bobby Fischer have played it, and it, it weakens White's king side, it loses a pawn, but you get attacking chances by opening up the F-file, and it's amazing how many quick wins White achieves in this opening. So it is risky, but it's risky for both sides. And uh, Kieseritsky took the pawn. Uh, this was the standard defense in those days. There are other ways of playing, declining the pawn. But in those days, it was thought that it was White's prerogative to attack and Black had to defend. And defense in the middle of the 19th century meant really taking everything that was flung at you. And now, one possibility is this. It's called the King's Knight's Gambit. But Anderson didn't play that. He played the bishop out to c4. It's called the King's Bishop's Gambit. And interestingly, when Bobby Fischer played the King's Gambit, this was the line he used himself. Now, the point you made, Donald, about uh, exposing the White King, um, Kieseritzi's next move, check with the Queen, underscores this point, because now the check can't be parried by any sensible method, of course. Putting the pawn in the way would be silly. Black would just take it with the pawn. White has to move his King. So he did. He put the King here. And now White's not only lost a pawn, exposed his king, he's also had to move his king and give up the right of castling. Um, to modernise, this is a, a strange opening indeed. And now Black played this. Brian's counter gambit. Brian's counter gambit. Now who Brian was, I've no idea. Brian, I think, was an obscure 19th century player. Well, whoever he was, I think he was nuts. I mean, there must be a bit away. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I mean, Black should probably have developed a knight, perhaps played knight to f6 or something. I mean, but this was typical of the time. And I said before that, you know, it was considered that uh, Black had to defend and uh, take the stuff that was flung at him. But here we see, you know, perhaps the first and last time in this game where Black actually counterattacks by sacrificing something. And it, it's a funny move. I mean, White, of course, took the pawn. There's no reason not to. And I suppose that the justification for giving up the pawn in this fashion is that you you make a line for this bishop, the bishop can come here at some moment. Um, but Kieseritsky never actually did this, and it's hard to understand why he sacrificed that pawn. And what he did now was to bring the knight out, a sensible developing move, incidentally hitting the white pawn on e4, and out came the white knight, which hits the black queen. It really starts getting doubly interesting now, doesn't it? And the Black Queen went back to the square. And Anderson played this. It defends the pawn on e4, and it also opened up a path for the White Queen's bishop, which is on c1. And now Kieseritsky played this. And there's a very transparent threat of playing the knight into here check, which can't be taken because the rook on h1 will be hanging. And again, this is typical of the play of the day. Um, not much strategic forethought and operating with short-term tactical threats, such as this knight to g3 check. But of course White can parry that by playing his own knight to this h4 square. And of course now knight g3 check is rendered nugatory. And the white knight itself is coming into f5, uh, starting the persecution of the black queen, which becomes a theme of this game. So the game was more tactical in those days and strategic. Yes, they, they didn't really think much about long-term advantages. Um, they were really sort of playing for cheap shots all the time. And um, Kieseritsky played this. Now, everyone says shouldn't move the queen too many times in the opening. But he's got an idea in mind. He's attacking the knight on h4 and the bishop on b5. And White stops that by putting his own knight into f5. So you can see that queen g5, as you said, Donald, is rather a short-range tactical idea. It doesn't advance Black's position very much. 
um, it, for the sake of really a, an easily stoppable threat, White's now got a piece on F5 in a very strong attacking position. And now C6 attacking the bishop. And I think most people would automatically move that piece. They put it back here, say, to A4, or maybe drop it back here to C4. But Anderson didn't do that. And what we see now is the start of a most extraordinary attack. I mean, the game now becomes a kind of torrent, an orgy of sacrifices. But Anderson just doesn't bother about pieces at all. He just plays ruthlessly for the attack. He tries to obliterate his opponent. And it's real caveman, barbaric stuff. There's one jab after another. Isn't That's it? right. And he starts off with a move most people just wouldn't, wouldn't consider. He plays this move, pawn to g4, attacking the black knight. And of course, black can't take that on passant, this move, because the white bishop on c1 attacks the black queen. So that's out of court. And um, what Kieseritsky does is he drops his knight back to the f6 square. And he must have felt quite happy with himself now, because he's still attacking the white bishop on b5, which didn't move. And he has a double threat against the white pawn on g4. So he must have been thinking that really his opening strategy, if you can call it that, or his opening tactics, had triumphed, because he has a double attack. He's bound to win material. But Anderson, of course, had foreseen this. And he now comes up with the justification for his previous move, rook to g1. Truly amazing move. I mean, it's, it's just incredible the depth of conception that went into this. He just leaves his bishop on b5 to be taken, which black did. c takes b5. And now we see the point of Anderson's idea. Pawn to h4. I'd love to see that happen. That's, that's the sort of thing I like to see happening to an arrogant queen. An arrogant queen, <laughs> right. So Keith Ritz is moving his queen around in the opening and trying to hack bits off the white position and... You know, really very provocative moves of the queen. And now the queen itself is in desperate straits. It's only got one square. It drops back to g6. Otherwise, the queen's lost. And Anderson comes on again. He's really a, a madman of aggression in this game, attacking the queen once more. The queen has to go forwards, back where it came from. But now it's really running out of squares. Running out of options. <laughs> and up comes Anderson's own queen, queen to f3. Now White's lost a bishop, he's a whole bishop down. But the threat is bishop on c1, takes the pawn on f4, and that really would completely ca capture the black queen. The queen would be lost. So Kieseritsky has to take drastic measures in order to counteract this. And what he does is he moves his knight back to the g8 square, putting it back where it came from. But at least the queen now has a backwards avenue of escape. White takes the pawn, bishop takes. Queen goes back to f6, escaping the threat. Why didn't he go further, Ray? I mean, well, he <laughs> go back to d8. But, you know, to my, uh, do you remember the old Beyond the Fringe thing? Get right out of the area. Yeah. You'd think he'd want to get right out of the area. <laughs> well, I think he's trying to win more material. You see, White's now got a perfect mobilization after his next move. But Black, Kieseritsky, is still trying to win material. Out comes the bishop hitting the white rook on g1. And the white knight ominously goes into d5. And now white's mobilization is fantastic. The knights are working, the bishop's working, the queen's working. Black's only got two pieces in the game. And what black does now is the only pieces in the attack that aren't working for white are the two rooks. And black decides to win white's rooks. He takes this pawn with the queen. And taking the queen's knight pawn with the queen is always, the b pawn with the queen is always very dangerous. In this position, it's especially dangerous. And now we get this fantastic concluding combination that really earns this game the title of the immortal game. Anderson doesn't bother with his queen's rook on a1, the king's rook on g1. He just plays for the attack. This man is an animal. <laughs> Bishop d6, that's giving up both the rooks. And this is the introduction of what's become known as the immortal theme, where you give up both rooks in the corner, you play for the attack, you just leave the rooks where they are, the opponent slices them off, you ignore it. This is the immortal theme in chess. Well, you don't think that's all Kizaritsky was sort of setting him up? <laughs> I mean, I'm not denying the, the brilliance of the band. There was a kind of, of course, he took the rook, queen takes rook check, 
uh, fell for it. <laughs> so it was kind of code of honour in those days, you see. When they were offered sacrifices, they had to take it. Right. They felt they were on a bound to take it. Up comes the king. And now, of course, he takes the other rook. Bishop takes g1. And now Anderson doesn't do anything flashy. He doesn't give a check. He could play knight c7 check, for example. He's two rooks and a bishop down. And now he plays this move, which is kind of closing the net. And Kieseritsky, as a kind of concession to what we would call you know, modern principles, finally develops a piece. But now... Too late. <laughs> it's too late, and Anderson's got him. Knight takes g7 check. The king goes to d8. And now it's worth pausing for a minute to look at this position. White's made all these sacrifices. He's really let his position be blown away by this greedy black opponent. And he's got to justify it. He's got to find a way of putting the boot in. And he sacrificed so much, and what's there left to sacrifice? The queen. Donald, can you see the next move? Well, you threw that at me very suddenly there. Um, no. <laughs> well, Anderson had to see this a long time ago. I mean, this is move 22 in the game. And he really had to see this possibility at least seven moves back. And this is it, the final coup de grace. Check. You know, he's chucked in the bishop, the two rooks, and now the queen goes as well. Queen f6 check. There's absolutely no choice. Black has to take the queen. And now the final point of this wonderful game, bishop e7, checkmate. Beautiful to watch. And then Cesaritsky bowled over himself, the loser, bowled over with excitement and admiration, rushed out of Simpsons in the Strand, nearest telegram office, telegram to Paris, Sent the moves to the Café de la Régence where he was the chess tutor. That's fantastic, isn't it? A Wonderful. Fantastic, yeah. Well, for sheer brilliance. Um, and I must say that, though, Kizaruski sort of walks in. Didn't he sort of help set himself up, in a way? Yes, I mean, Kizaruski had this reputation as an unpleasant as an unpleasant person. You know, he was, you know, as I said before, he died penniless, as so many great masters have done, unfortunately. Nobody came to Yes, why is that so many uh, star chess players? I think it's, uh, chess players in those days were artists and they led a precarious existence. And they, tense uh, attention. Often, you know, living off the patronage of, 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 of rich admirers of the game. But you know, even given this unfortunate reputation, it was a, a grand gesture to go and telegraph the moves. Yeah. Well, that was a fantastic game fantastic to start the series, game. Donald. Yes. Very impressive. Good start. And now it's good night from Donald and myself and the chess team at Thames. Next week, we'll be looking at the brilliant game between the first American chess genius, Paul Morphy, and the German master, Louis Paulsen. Join us then. Mm -hmm.